This group of companies is ingrained in every part of, of the Sacramento real estate market. Home builders, construction companies, developers, why aren't you just building more to keep up with demand? Uh, generally, what do you say to that? That's always the challenge. You know, we went through a, a, an exorbitant increase in demand during, the down, during COVID. Unprecedented. Normally, we as home builders would try and keep up with that demand. What happened during COVID, as we all saw, is we didn't have supplies and we didn't have labor. So we couldn't keep up with the demand. But we also have a e bigger issue in California is that there's not enough land. And I, w by land, I mean available lots to build on. And that's the biggest challenge that I see in California is the availability of, of lots when the market demands. And it's very challenging in California to build lots and develop lots to be able to meet demand. Uh, you know, I shared with you earlier the challenge of a community just about three miles north of here is coming up on just now breaking ground, just to get re lots ready for home builders, which wouldn't be for another couple of years. That project is approaching 22 years in approvals. You can't match a market, you can't meet the market, market demand if you are taking 22 years to bring a community to market. That's a challenge in California, and that's and sadly, not an outlier. 22 years is not an outlier in this state. It's really a challenge. So when people say, why aren't you, you know, meeting demand, you can say, oh, I would love to. Hey, I see there's demand. I'm going to go ahead and get a project started. Yep. You might not be able to bring that to market for 10, 12, 22 years. Yeah. And let's, you know, even as a community like this, let's use this for an example. These were finished lots that, w w that were purchased. Well, once those lots were purchased, finished lots ready to build on, we now have to go through the approval process for all the homes. That can take anywhere from six months to a year and a half, depending on where you are in Sacramento. That's also never gonna match up to demand. If I, I see a huge demand spike, it, like we did in summer of 2020, well, if I had lots available, but I didn't have product available, I'm looking at missing that because now I'm, I'm six months to almost two years to be able to finally get a house vertical now, once that house is vertical, it's still six to nine months to build the house. I may have missed it. That's a challenge. Where are we standing right now? Yeah, so we're in a brand new home community in uh, West Roseville. So this is part of the growth path of West Roseville. And, West Roseville, and Roseville's done a really good job at growing and growing smart. And this is part of that development. So this is a combination of the lots that we're in now, our third of an acre lots, backing up to open space, which is absolutely amazing and really rare. Uh, and then we have more traditional development just across the street here that uh, some other builders are building that is what you normally see, a normal subdivision where it's a little bit more compact, uh, but it's a little bit more attainable housing. And and this is a little higher end than what we're in right now, but it's a, it's a mix within the neighborhood. So it's a good mix of socioeconomics within an overall community. But we have 11 homes in this community, uh, but the overall master plan has several hundred. What do you anticipate these houses going for once they're finished and ready to go? Yeah, so the homes that we're in now uh, are anywhere from about uh, 950,000 on up to about a million two uh, for what we're in right now, uh, a little bit larger, a little bit larger lots, a little bit higher end spec level, meaning the amenities that are built into the home. And then you have the homes across the street with the, with the, uh, the public builders. These are publicly traded builders. Uh, and those are gonna be in the fives and sixes. So again, a, a little bit more of that attainable level. Um, and certainly they've got some stuff that's in the higher end from there, but it's a good mix. Attainable housing versus affordable housing. Yeah, so you know, I always try and use the, uh, affordable housing is such a big topic right now, and we're really challenged to build affordable housing. I kind of defined affordable housing is, is, is something that's subsidized, something that is, you know, is trying to get to a price point but isn't naturally attainable in California, so it's subsidized in some way to, to have affordable housing. Attainable housing is what all of us in, in the home building industry really are, are striving for, is how do we build something that is for that middle market? That's the, you know, the, the, our most common homeowner that's here in Sacramento. That's that, you know, that worker that is working their butt off, makes a great living, but just can't aff afford a $700,000 house. That used to be that $300,000 house. It used to be a $150,000 house. Now it's 500 is that, that price point. But how do we figure out how to get below that? That's a challenge in California and really a challenge in Sacramento. It's not subsidized housing. It's not luxury housing. It's what a lot of people are building yeah, for. Yeah, it's that perfect middle market where all of us would love to build more houses in, but it's really difficult to do. So what is going into 
the prices of these homes? That's the challenge. So it starts with land. And if we start with land, land is really expensive in California. We all know that. But it's expensive because of the process to build, build, bring a community to life. You know, I talked about the community that's north of us, 22 years. That's a big expense to carry that much dirt for 22 years. And that makes it expensive. And it takes that long because we have all of these challenges of lawsuits and approvals and all of these things that make it that much harder to develop the lots. Once those lots are developed, then we get into the cost of building the house. The permits, permits are a challenge in California. Permits are a big challenge in Sacramento. The North State Building Industry Association just did a study uh, and the main Sacramento County areas averaged $93,000 a house just for the privilege to build the house. That's really tough to build attainable housing if we're at an expensive land basis and $93,000, to, to, we haven't put anything on the dirt, we're at $93,000. That's tough. For comparison, the study found that the Central, Central Valley was averaging about $55,000. Uh, another big project in, or big area of development in California is the in Inland Empire in Riverside County also about $55,000. You look at neighboring states, Arizona and Nevada are averaging 30,000. Phoenix and Vegas are averaging 20,000. Those are two big housing markets. Why is it that price there, but we're at $93,000 in Sacramento? What happened? And that's not just the building permits, that's school fees, that's park fees, that's fire fees. Like there's just a huge laundry list of fees. That's a challenge to be able to bring attainable housing to the market. Yeah, fee creep is what I call it because it's just slowly inched up. And each time a department or a municipality was able to get a little bit more, then it became a little bit more and then a little bit more. And it's, there was no deliberate act or malice in any of this. It just fee creep. And you end up with bureaucracies that just keep going for more and going for more and trying to put 100% of the burden on the, what they think is the builders but it's not on us, it becomes uh, you know, the burden on the homeowners. We got to reduce the burden on the homeowners. Now you're also dealing with labor shortages and, and the cost of materials and, and uh, you know, backed up supplies. COVID went through the roof and was super busy, right? Well, we, should, we as home builders normally go, oh great, we're gonna build more homes this year. Well, we didn't have materials and we didn't have any labor. Well, that's really hard to build if we don't have either of those things. And the price of lumber alone you know, lumber's averaged on a, a, about a thousand, it's a thousand board feet is what they measure it on. Averaged about 250 to $350, a, you know, a, a unit of measurement over the last 25 years. It spiked to $1,500 during, the, the, during COVID and is now leveled out, I shouldn't say leveled out, it's spiked up and down <laughs> in at about 550. Well, that's over 60% higher than the 25 year average. That goes into the price of the house that reduces our ability to deliver attainable housing. And you look at overall materials, the National Association of Home Builders just did a study on what the overall pricing increases of materials were, it was over 19%. That's tough to have a 19% increase in housing cost, never mind price. Normally in, in a normal market, as those costs go up, builders' margins come down and it gets really, really thin. And we're a thin margin business anyways, nobody realizes that. But as those things went up, Luckily, housing pricing went up with it because there was so much demand. So it did balance things out, but it, it was kind of an inverse relationship. It really ended up being a challenge. And when you talk about uh, building materials, we're talking about everything from drywall. Yeah, look at where we are. You know, we've got plywood, we've got lumber, we've got steel, we've got drywall. All of these things, each thing kept going up and up and up because we had a shortage of manufacturing, we had a shortage of supply. We have all of these challenges. You know, lumber is the poster child for uh, the challenges. If we if we're up s over sixty percent, you know, just from the historical norm, we have a challenge. We have huge restrictions on f on lumber production in on state or on federal forest land, right? Well, if we could solve that and maybe improve the health of our forests and not follow what, what some of you know the external influencers are causing. If we could do that and be able to bring in more lumber, maybe make our forests a little healthier and not have to deal with the extremes of forest fires, maybe there's where we could get some of our supply and domestically produce something. You know, we're one of the last industries that is produced, we're a hand-built thing. 
Everything you see here is hand built. We don't do that anymore in the, in the US. Home building is one of that last bastions of home built. It's pretty cool, yeah. but we've got to support it somehow. I love innovation. You know, home building is one of the last places you'll ever see a, uh, innovation. We're a risk averse business, even though everything we do is very risky because the, the market ups and downs, but we're a very risk averse business. Partly because we know how to build things and we know what works. State of California, we have uh, the SB 800 law, which requires us to have a 10 year warranty on the house on structural defects. Well, we wanna make sure that that house is built right and built well and not having any variables to, because we're on the hook for 10 years for that home. None of us are arguing that that should go away because that's a good thing, but it also prevents us from trying something new. We can't just try something new because this is such a long process. Throwing something new into the middle may mean that we add four or six or nine months to learn how to do that process. Well, we talked about earlier that four to six to nine months, we may have missed the market. That's also a risk. But because of the challenges in labor and supplies, getting into a manufacturing process, I think is a huge thing. I don't think anybody's perfectly solved it yet, but there's a bunch of companies that are doing some really cool stuff. Uh, I know the, you know, you looked at the 3D printing. I love that concept. Uh, you know, there's certainly some challenges with it, but what a cool concept, and I think there's something there. The more that we can look at those type of things, and I think if we look at other countries that are doing it way better than we are, maybe there's something there. We would love to bring more new things like 3D printing and those kind of things, but if we brought that to a community here in Sacramento, we now have to educate all the building officials, all the planning officials, because it's different. And the planning officials in those types are elected. Well, if they approve something oddball and nobody likes it, they lost their job the next time around, right? So there's a little bit of that that goes in as, as part of the bureaucracy of housing in, in the state. And so that's always a challenge because nobody wants to take a risk. Nobody wants to jump out and go, oh, I want to build something really cool. Like Australia's done a really good job with modern housing and, and some really cool looking housing. We've tried to do that several times in the Sacramento region and bring much more modern architecture and it gets shot down by the municipalities because it's too different. It stands out in the neighborhood. The consumer wants it, but the politicals, like, that's a little too odd for us, and I don't want to be the one that takes the risk that says, yeah, we can do that. Because if it backlashes on me, then you know how that goes. Is there like one or two things you could point to that would say, like, this needs to change in our industry, or in the, in the, you know, the regulations around our industry? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that we're talking about right now and is starting to get a lot more traction is CEQA reform. CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, enacted during the Reagan era back in the 70s great thing. It was trying to be able to make sure that we are developing in a proper way and developing homes that meet environmental quality, meet you know, roads and all services and all of these things. It was a great idea, but it became this broad way for every either individual or organization to stop or slow down development. When the one neighbor has a voice to be able to shut down a project versus the other hundred that would benefit from that community and being developed, that's an issue. So we have to deal with CEQA reform, and there's a lot of great studies that are out right now. UC Berkeley just did a great one. So there's a lot of great studies that are out there that are talking about how to do CEQA reform, and I think if we got that back into what it originally was intended to do, I think that would be a good thing for California, and hopefully shorten our timelines to development, which makes land more affordable, which brings down the overall cost of the homes. It allows us to build more efficiently. We can meet market demand instead of reacting to do to market demand, all of those kind of things I think would be huge. And then we've got to look at, at the overall fee structure for California in general and Sacramento especially. When you're at $93,000 a home, it's really hard to build an affordable house. Anything attainable is really difficult when you start with just 100 grand right off the top. If we want to build $300,000 houses again in Sacramento, well, the land has to be zero and then the building cost has to be negative. That doesn't really work. As an industry, we're all trying to figure out how do we build better, build stuff that the consumer actually wants, that the consumer can afford, but there are so many external influences that prevent us from doing that in an efficient way. And I think if we can have more open conversations, and I really appreciate you guys doing this, the more that we can have open conversations, I think we get to a better place and can hopefully start to see some improvements. The biggest thing, we get social media comments all the time about, you know, every time we raise prices and we're building a home for $500,000 or a million five or whatever the price point is, we're, it's too much. It's, we're, we're, we're really just taking advantage of people and we're making piles and piles of money. That's not the case. You have to look at the cost of the land, 
the permit number, and then the cost to build the home, there's only that little bit much left on top, and it's not a lot. And the more that we can make some more efficiencies in those middles, then that allows us to bring those things down. But people have to understand there's more than just $500,000 that you see on a social media post uh, you know, about a new home community. What went into that is probably about $490,000 worth of cost. And there's that little bit left over. If you understand that, you know, that helps to understand how do we fix things in California. And there's a lot of vo vocal people in, I don't want that in my neighborhood. Those are the kind of things that we have to start having more conversations on. Don't rail against the builder for trying to build something. Let's figure out how to build a community out and giving a voice to everybody. But there has to be a realization that that project may need to go in your backyard. And I understand you have a voice, but we've got to figure out how to be able to build more attainable housing. And there's a lot of solutions to it. But when everybody has a voice to be able to file a sequel lawsuit or any, you know, anything against the city or the counties to be able to prevent these type of projects, that's a challenge. So you think about a developer, as the developer is carrying the land in California, they're the ones taking the big risk. They bought the piece of farmland, they bought a piece of infill d dirt that's in downtown Sacramento or something like that. They now have to go through the, what's called the entitlement process. That entitlement process is, is a couple of years to decades. That decades, they own the land, they have an opportunity cost that that money is tied up that they can't do something else with, so that becomes more and more expensive. Along the way, they have hundreds of thousands of dollars, sometimes millions of dollars in engineering fees, consultant fees, all of these things that go along the process. If you start adding that up over decades and decades, or even years and years alone, that's tons and tons of money. Every time that keeps, they get a new bill, that land goes up. You know, that interest rate carries you know, for that opportunity cost, whether they had it for cash or they had a loan on it. That is an opportunity cost that they can't do something else with. That keeps getting more expensive. If we were able to bring something to market in a couple of years and predictably do that, then that brings down that cost. If we try to bring something to market today and we don't know if we're going to be able to build this in five or 15 years, we don't know what that's going to cost. If we get to 15 years, there's a lot of expenses that went into that that get really expensive at the tail end of that. Just keeps raising costs. And we're still an undersupplied market. Sacramento is still wildly undersupplied. We have a net in-migration that's really rare. California had a net out-migration of six figures. That's a big thing. We have a net in-migration. Well, those people need to buy a house. And we've got a limited inventory on resale. We've got a limited inventory of new homes. Where do they go? Rents are high. It all kind of goes together. How do we fix the problem? Yeah. You know, Americans are built on helping, right? Or we used to be. And how do we do that? You know, but now we're you know, a voice of negatives. How do we bring that back to a voice of positives?